Every day around 8.40, they close the street so kids can walk uh, past the street or bike to go to school. Well, in the morning, you usually have kids around here. They are drawing, they are playing. This morning, we had bike day. Uh, and afternoon, usually, you can see parents that are standing all around the street because now they have space. Yeah, like, it's been amazing. You can do anything on the street. Yeah. And I think more people have bikes because we're allowed to, like, bike around on the street. Hi everyone, welcome to the Active Towns podcast, conversations about creating a culture of activity. My name is John Zimmerman. I'm the founder of the Active Towns Initiative, and I'm honored to serve as your host each week on this podcast journey. Thank you so much for tuning in. It's always wonderful to have you along for the ride. Today is Friday, December 17th, 2021, episode number 103, and our final regular episode for this calendar year. Although I do have a very special holiday live stream event featuring Ryan Van Duzer, this coming Monday evening, December 20th at 6 p.m. Eastern. So stay tuned for more information on that. But first, today, I'm excited to share this conversation I recently had with Dale Bracewell, manager of transportation planning for the city of Vancouver, British Columbia. Arguably one of the two most bicycle friendly cities in all of North America. We discussed the status of the high comfort cycle network build out and some specific design adaptations to their protected and separated lanes that have taken place since my last visit to Vancouver for the Walk Bike Places conference in 2016. We also talked about how the city is leveraging active mobility to address the climate emergency in response to the pandemic. But before we roll into those discussions, please allow me a brief moment to mention that this episode is being brought to you by the generous contributions of our donors, sponsors, and monthly patrons on our Patreon page. And we did get a new patron this week. Thanks so much, Jacob B. Welcome to the team. Now, if you too are in a position to help out, just head over to my website at activetowns.org and navigate to the donation page. Every contribution, no matter how small, is greatly appreciated, and it really does have a big impact on my ability to do this work. Oh, and by the way, there are three other ways you can really help support my efforts right now that don't involve money. First, if you like listening to audio podcasts, please simply subscribe to the Active Towns audio podcast on your preferred platform. Second, if you're watching this episode on YouTube, please subscribe to the Active Towns channel and be sure to click on the bell next to the subscribe button so that you'll get a nice little reminder when new videos are posted. It's usually only about once per week, so it won't be a big disruption. And finally, please help me spread the word about the Active Towns Initiative and this episode by sharing it with a friend or anyone else you think might be interested and could benefit from this content. Thank you all so much for tuning in and for whatever support you're able to provide as I strive to grow this movement to create a culture of activity for all ages and abilities. Okay, let's get this conversation with Dale Bracewell rolling. I am absolutely delighted to welcome to the Active Towns podcast, Dale Bracewell. Dale, how are you? Good, John. It's uh, nice to see you and kind of in a face-to-face way. And so, yeah, doing well here in uh, Vancouver, British Columbia, here in Canada. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, hey, let's get our let's get our scroll going here so we can actually uh, <laughs> let people know that, yes, this is episode number 103. And, and so, Dale, so you're the manager of transportation for the city of Vancouver, British Columbia. Um, why don't you do this? Why don't you give us a little bit of, you know, background information, you know, who you are and, and how you came to be doing this type of work? Yeah, great. Sure. Uh, it was actually only 20 years ago I started at the city of Vancouver in, it was a branch at the time called strategic transportation planning and sort of on the active mobility side, my first major project, and we'll kind of come back to this, I think was uh, a long-term strategy for our false Creek uh, uh, bridges. So how to do pedestrian and bike improvements um, kind of over the long term. So we'll kind of touch on that. Um, Did various roles all the way through Olympic games here when we hosted in uh, 2010. And then probably most relevant was I was the city's first ever manager of active transportation. Uh, so coming out of Olympics in late 2010, that was when our first real effort to consolidate in one team all of our walking and cycling and greenways uh, efforts. 
and at the same time um, was uh, co-leading um, our long-range transportation plan, which is Transportation 2040. And then uh, since uh, we met again in 2016, I've uh, been the manager of uh, transportation uh, planning at the city of Vancouver. Fantastic. That's great. Let's bring me back in here. Um, so yeah, so and then we've also had a chance to to, to meet up uh, in Los Angeles uh, at NACTO and, and we did a little uh, bike ride of uh, their their Figueroa project that they were pretty excited and proud to do and, and, and put together. I would think it was like one of their most significant, you know, protected bikeways. And you and I were kind of chuckling a little bit because they were pretty far behind in terms of doing uh, protected infrastructure. I just went back and watched uh, Clarence Eckerson's uh, Street Films video from 2016, and it just reminded me how wonderful it was to be there for the um, Walk Bike Places conference back in 2016. And, you know, how far the city really has come along. I mean, I have to think that the city of Vancouver in a North American context is, is right up there. Number one, number two, you know, of all places, you know, right there with Montreal, I would say, uh, unfortunately the, you know, we go pretty far down <laughs> to try, try to find an, uh, an American city in the United States that really has the comprehensive network that you all have accomplished there. Um, talk a little bit about that sort of that context in terms of from an active mobility perspective and how that relates to some of these other major challenges that we are facing as a society, uh, you know, whether it's climate. And then obviously we had a monkey wrench uh, in 2020 of, of, you know, the pandemic. And so all sorts of little niggles and all I'm sure it had you jumping through a whole bunch of different uh, hoops. So let's kind of head in that direction. You know that I have a whole bunch of visuals that we can pull up, so don't hesitate to say, you know, you know, have have me pull something up if uh, if we want to have that as as some context, and then we also have some video that we could also do if you'd like. So I'll let you take it from there, and maybe uh, talk a little bit about uh, you know where things have transpired and sort of shifted from from that 2016 uh, orientation. Okay. I'll, I'll do as quickly as I can, a little backing up for people to understand, like, how did we get to, you know, 2016? And if you want, you can just show some of the great street films video that Clarence uh, did to describe. I mean, for a while, we had been building out much more like local street bikeways and greenways and having actually some success in increasing the kind of percentage of people uh, cycling in Vancouver. But it was really, you know, moving um, beyond just painted bike lanes to uh, protected bike lanes. And for example, like Hornby, which was one of the main first two that we did downtown. And then by the time, you know, this video was shot in 2016, we had done a bit of a, a downtown network expansion. And, and, you know, not to just be clear in Vancouver, we don't have this great protected bike lane network throughout the city yet. Uh, we focused on where, as you can see in the downtown in the city center, where many of the jobs are, and we have over 100,000 people living downtown. So really being able to show some success early for many people to make many of those shorter trips that um, you know supported their opportunities to cycle and, and also doing that as part of our launch of our public bike share. So kind of doing that all together and not just protected bike lanes, you just saw on that one there, also uh, protected intersections. Um, so really trying to, and that of course is better for people walking and for people cycling and sort of doing that all together. Um, so I think we've continued on in that journey since uh, 2016, maybe not as uh, as a faster pace as we did uh, coming out of uh, 2012 when we really uh, had our long range transportation plan and the whole idea of all ages and ability um, being kind of our cycling design guideline standard. Um, and so, yeah, but I guess kind of a little bit of transition to kind of where we're going is um, very much not so specific on walking or biking per se, uh, where we're looking at, you know, climate emergency and really uh, kind of more of where we have to go is where are those, um, you know, greenhouse gases coming from? Well, that is coming from cars, largely speaking. And so, but as a direction uh, toward the very short term uh, 2030 target, uh, really, you know, more holistically looking at transportation planning, which of course points us more into the direction of active mobility, points us more to, to uh, transit. And of course, if you still are driving, um, how do we support as a city electrification of cars or um, shared mobility? 
Um, but that's a little bit of kind of where we've been and where we're going in terms of, of the approach. But at the same time, we continue to build out our all age and ability cycling network, um, continue to expand our, our bike share, um, and are soon approaching actually bringing in e-bikes uh, to our bike share and continuing on with our promotional and other um, encouragement and uh, vision zero safety programs as we continue to want to build out a walkable and bikeable uh, Vancouver. Yeah, yeah. Since uh, we had a few images here on the video uh, that showed the uh, uh, the planter installations before we hit the record button, you were sharing with me that you you all have gone to a different sort of treatment uh, to that, not really being there at at uh, at these guys anymore. Uh, and I can pull up an image that is a little bit more of an update to uh, what you're doing. But why don't you explain a little bit about what those were for, for those uh, individuals who in those cities that, that might want to you know, do maybe that that two step process of you know, starting with something like this you know, and then, you know, when available and, and you have the funding to be able to do so, uh, building something more permanent. Yeah, it's great. Um, yeah, maybe even to context of what you're seeing here in, in Hornby, you know, back when we were first approving this, it was really clear in the consultation that we we wanted to build protected infrastructure, but we didn't want it just to come across as more like concrete. We're trying to be a very livable, uh, public realm friendly downtown. And so this was a, a, a great suggestion to uh, bring in uh, protected bike lanes and bring in some, some green landscaping aspect through these temporary uh, planters. Um, these are still great. These are still actually on Hornby in the sense of kind of a, that type of uh, direction, but you know, there's a certain amount of maintenance and, and care uh, that you need to do. And what it's not doing, um, which we're kind of looking at more holistically in our kind of public works streets infrastructure, is that stormwater management and green infrastructure. So if you want, you could bring up the one, uh, it's, it's actually called Richard Street, yeah. So what you see here, and a lot of this you is underground in terms of the, the, the engineering that <laughs> my team, for example, in transportation planning would not be involved in, but just um, fantastic collaborative work um, across uh, many of the divisions here in engineering to really not just then deliver a great public realm, better walking, um, better cycling, here's a two-way protected bike lane, but really, you know, you can see the street trees here and this got permeable pavers and there's a whole bunch of other, you know, green infrastructure underground that you can't see that'll support um, the health of that tree in particular, but also just those kind of rainstorm events. We get lots of rain in Vancouver. Um, so this is a, a really important part. So we're calling more of this a Richard Street complete street because what it's doing is it's not just delivering, um, you know, kind of compared to Hornby, a protected bike lane. It's, it's much more of a complete street. And here we've got, you know, localized widening, um, can't remember if this is where the hotel is or just additional drop off. Um, you can see pure later, um, uh, truck. You can see a, a shift delivery cargo bike. Um, really kind of bringing in a lot more of the needs, including that green infrastructure, uh, right from the get go. So a lot more expensive, just to be clear. Uh, I'm sure other cities will be like, can you do it as cheap? No, you can't. Uh, but ultimately we think we can come in once maybe and really holistically deliver, uh, for, for all modes and all people in the way they want to move around, um, in Vancouver. Yeah. When I look at things from the lens of behavior change and behavior modification, and when I look at the resistance that takes place in many, many cities around the world, I love this one, this two-step process of being able to create some authentic, uh, you know, protected infrastructure that really gives people an idea of what authentic all ages and abilities facilities look like and feel like. And then when you have, you know, you, in other words, you, you give the, the community enough time and enough experience, authentic, true experience and bring them along with you. And then when you're, you know, when you have the, the ability to do the planning and get the resources to be able to do something like this, absolutely beautiful and absolutely fantastic. This reminds me a lot of, um, the cultural trail in, um, in Indianapolis where they, you know, went through and put in incredibly high quality infrastructure using the permeability. You know, you have that stormwater, you know, issue that you're working on. There's a lot of stuff that's going on that also, you know, speaks back to the, the climate emergency stuff that we're looking at here. And the other, the other thing that I love about this shot 
and I think you know the direction I'm heading on this, is, is that little cargo bike because that's also one of the key things and themes that we need to you know, address when we look at our cities is how do we start reducing you know, the number of, of you know, <laughs> vehicles that are you know, contributing to that, uh, you know, that climate challenge and, and you can actually count the number of uh, delivery trucks right here in this shot. So it's a, a perfect uh, uh, example for this, uh, this little guy is that he's, you know, that, that cargo bike is there and I'll pull up a better image of it as well, but talk a little bit about that because I think that's very strategic in terms of the position that not only the city, but I think also the province is, is taking on in this regard. Is that correct? Yeah. So maybe we'll go again back one step and then kind of uh, talk about cycle logistics and, you know, because again, we, we did make good progress on delivery, I'd say, of our AAA, uh, you know, cycling network. Um, but again, back to that long range transportation 2040 plan, when we looked at all the actions, um, we realized, you know, we hadn't really spent as much time on goods movement. So, yeah, we were really adventuring much more into uh, urban freight. And of course, the pandemic, and I'll credit one of my uh, younger engineers, she came up with the term invisible freight. You, you were referencing the trucks that actually have uh, names on it. There's a whole bunch of other uh, vans and deliveries that are going on in our city that we don't even really have a great handle on. So kind of with that in mind, yeah, a real partnership emerged with us and the province of British Columbia through the, the Ministry of Transportation to actually partner together to really learn what could we do more in terms of that last mile delivery, not everywhere, again, in the parts of Vancouver where there's a, enough density, um, where ultimately in this pilot that we're doing together, uh, trucks will uh, uh, take their deliveries and offload them into a facility. And that's part of the pilot is we're renting uh, industrial space to have the trucks offload the deliveries. And we actually um, had a, mi a minimum of two companies, but we're actually going to have three um, companies. A shift actually uh, here has been a local provider is going to be one of them, and then two other uh, private companies. Um, and basically, for minimum six months, hopefully longer, um, we are going to have them do that last mile delivery through e-cargo bikes. And each of them, um, in return for kind of a subsidized uh, space, so that they get a real chance um, in the private urban freight market to really test out their uh, hopefully forward thinking in this. Um, we'll get all the, the data in terms of the trips and the number of opportunities that provide uh, the cars or the vans that otherwise aren't delivering. And, and then this kind of matches up with, of course, then the infrastructure is, you know, where and how do, when you use urban e-cargo bikes like this, which facilities do they prefer? Do we have even the proper width? Do we have enough of a network um, so that we aren't just hearing from, you know, people who are already cycling uh, of course, all those are trying to encourage to uh, make that an opportunity for themselves. Uh, but now, as we think again of a, of a dense urban city, uh, downtown, commerce, uh, growing economy, um, we're bringing in that other dimension of uh, urban freight and goods movement. And so that's an exciting pilot we're doing with, uh, with the province of, of BC. And that's where we're aligned. We have our climate emergency action goal. Um, so we're both interested in reducing greenhouse gases. And, um, you know, province is equivalent of a state in, in the United States. And so they have their equivalent clean BC, where they're trying to do their part at that kind of ministry provincial level. And so we've got uh, an opportunity to learn through some really objective data about this cycle logistics and, and last mile urban freight opportunity in Vancouver. Yeah. And I'll, I'll pull up... Uh... The uh, climate emergency uh, action plan document here. So, uh, and this is this is something that's that is when I saw that the city of Vancouver, you know, move forward with it. This was just in 2020, correct? Yes. Okay. Yeah. When I saw that this came down, I was like, yes, finally a you know really a a, a, a an action plan that has some teeth to it and, you know, in a North American city. And I, I'm not sure if there's any other North American city that's really moving forward as quickly as, as you all are doing that. Talk a little bit about this and, and, and especially in your role where this really, uh, you know, kind of hits home because if mm -hmm. I remember correctly, somewhere around 40% of Vancouver's, uh, you know, 
carbon challenge is uh, associated with with transportation. Is that number about right? You're right. It's, uh, <laughs> Thirty-seven. Uh, otherwise, oh, rounded to go. So well done, John. Yeah, I mean this this is kind of um, one of those massive things that hits the work plan. Uh, it was actually early 2019 when, at that time, a kind of new mayor and council uh, declared a climate emergency in Vancouver, and of course, other cities were doing you know the same. Uh, in and around the same time, but we only had three months to report back on what we thought could be a more accelerated sustainable transportation target that obviously would support a, a faster reduction of greenhouse gases as it relates to vehicles. And so we uh, reported out in uh, April 2019 that what we thought we needed to do, so that remember that long-range transportation 2040 plan, our, our long-range target at that time was in 2040, let's be two-thirds of all daily trips uh, be by walking, cycling, and transit. And so to kind of take that whole three month summary as we reported back to council, we said, if you think um, you wanna follow through on this and we wanna make that 40% contribution through vehicles, we need to move up that target by a decade. And, and they agreed. So we moved up our sustainable mode split daily target of two thirds trips being walking, cycling, and transit from 2040 to 2030. And then we spent the next year and a half um, until ultimately council approved the action plan in November 2020 to outline um, either continuing the journey that we were already on in terms of sustainable transportation progress, uh, but also bringing in uh, some other game changers and uh, some other actions that we just weren't really following through, um, all to say this is how we could get there in a decade. Um, and so it's been pretty exciting and so I'll, I'll kind of touch on three things and we can kind of double back if we need to. So number one is land use because you know this has been part of our story. Um, always want to give credit to our land use planners uh, creating that 15 minute city, creating the walkable destinations uh, is obviously key for, for all cities who aspire to either climate emergency or sustainable transportation goals. And so we have a big move number one which is actually doing more of that across the city in, in a faster way um, and so lots to talk about that through our long range Vancouver plan that's currently underway. Um, and then the second one is called Big Move 2, which is our sustainable transportation mode split that moving it up a decade. But, uh, but uh, a topic we might want to get to is when we said, if we're going to be serious about trying to do this in a decade, um, we didn't have a need at the city level to think that we had to have a conversation on transport pricing. We were waiting for the region of Vancouver, the Metro Vancouver region, which had actually done work um, as recently as 2018, to kind of let that progress. But we told our council, if you'd like this, we think in our city center, we need to, and take, we're going to take years to have this conversation because <laughs> it's not an easy one. Uh, but this is where in climate emergency, you need to um, bring in the, the realm of pricing, your public space is what it is. Uh, because you need to complement that with the faster road space reallocation for walking and cycling and transit. And so that's kind of where these are all getting wo woven together through our climate emergency action plan. And then the last one, again, it's not that we weren't doing anything on it, but again, from a demand management perspective, uh, really looking to TransLink who manages the transit in the region and, and kind of their relationships on the employer level. But we felt that we as a city needed to. So now we have a uh, a transportation demand management uh, action plan, uh, working more uh, specifically with employers, working more specifically with schools, uh, and then where the pandemic <laughs> made it really real is, you know, where the trip doesn't need to be taken. So remote work and where is that actually going to still help contribute to livability and our climate emergency goals and yet yeah, embracing, of course, uh, the economy and the trips that should and want to be taken for all of uh, what people would like to do and love to do in, in Vancouver. Um, and so kind of how does that all fit together? And that's all in our climate emergency action plan. It was basically an update right. to uh, our transportation plan um, in, in that sense in, in a really fast way. Yeah. And I pulled up the uh, the mode share update and you actually touched uh, on it a couple of times in, in, in your conversation right there. Uh, and one of the things, obviously, that jumps right out at you is the total number of daily trips obviously went way down in, in 2020. And we can see, you know, sort of the hit that, that transit really took uh, in, in that situation. Again, not a big surprise. Um, it is, uh, you know, also not a big surprise that, you know, the 
relative percentage of people um, in motor vehicles um, actually went up. Uh, not tremendously, but you know it it did go up and uh, and and probably absorbed a, a fair number of those uh, transit trips. I would think. Um, talk a little bit about where you feel like things are going to. I mean, we don't have a crystal ball, but you know, in twenty twenty one. Um, do you get the sense that you're, you're going to look more like 2019 or more like 2020? Uh, I think for the shorter term, we're going to look more like uh, 2020, mm-hmm. uh, and I'll just use our own employer as an example. Um, we're certainly embracing, you know, remote, uh, flexible hybrid work. And so mm-hmm. really looking for that more optimum balance. What did we learn through the pandemic when basically all city of Vancouver employees who are not kind of operational delivering um, things in the public realm and kind of working more in the office setting. So what's that, that fit where you want to have some in-person time to be collaborative, building up your team, uh, working together, working with the community, and yet really benefiting from these opportunities where we get to do a lot of the work from home. So I don't think we're going to be alone in that. So I think and, and it's going to be a graduation back to how much do you actually spend at work. Um, at the same time, I would say what will be more like 2019 is the vehicles. Um, so I think on the horizon sooner for us is a faster return to those levels of congestion as people take a longer time to ramp back into the full transit recovery, as an example, in terms of the probably the more often choice if you're um, – thinking of driving in, in a longer distance in Vancouver that's more oriented towards um, the transit trip. And even in 2020 and 2019, we saw that our walking and cycling from a mode share perspective didn't really actually change that much. Um, saw more recreational bike trips, for example, and less commuting, uh, but largely um, a percentage-wise the same. So yeah, so this is where kind of things like transportation demand management and part of this, what we did in the pandemic, is we created a remote work toolkit for employers. Um, just to help them understand for them, based on their own business and the way they want to operate, um, do you have all the tools and understanding of where remote flexible hybrid work is, is going to be best for you? And at the same time, thinking at it from a greenhouse gas uh, perspective, um, and as you welcome back people and bring people back to work in terms of the trips that you want to take, um, how are these kind of those, those are these are moments in time where behavior changes uh, tend to be easier. Um, and so, of course, not would have all the means, let's say, to make a, a beautiful bike mobility center or a bike parkade. But, you know, even the way you uh, either incentivize or encourage or reward your employees uh, for the times that you do want them to come to work at what time of the day, what days of the week. These are all opportunities that we're trying to embrace as much as we can. Beyond that remote work toolkit, we just launched a general employer's toolkit to, again, points towards active modes, points towards sustainable modes. Uh, points to even uh, the importance of uh, measuring and monitoring and and kind of, you know, the champions within an organization to be able to leverage uh, the success that they're having from a sustainable mobility perspective. And I think I found that toolkit. So let's pull this up here real quick so we have a little bit of that that visual. And, uh, yep, there you go. So the sustainability uh, mo- sustainable mobility toolkit for the employers and... It sounds like, as you just mentioned, you know, we don't really know what work is going to look like five years from now. Um, I think it, it I, I'm kind of with you. I think it's going to be a bit of a blend. Um, but it, it's it's encouraging to see that, you know, very you don't have to go very far into this document. And it's right there, the climate emergency. So you're bringing the context and the relevance to the reason why this is so incredibly important. What has been the response back from uh, some of the area employers to this toolkit? Uh, so far, I mean, it's it's just been welcomed in terms of, you know, I mean, people do appreciate when, you know, as governments uh, at all levels that we can kind of uh, aid and enable, you know, businesses towards tools without them having to create it uh, themselves. Um, at the same time, you know, it's, it's an opportunity for them to tell us about, about their, you know, some, definitely some concerns, especially in our city center about, you know, really, will there be enough people returning, like actually 
you know, um, making those trips. And so they, so it's a good opportunity for us to be really listening at the same time as we share these uh, tools uh, back out uh, to them and having, you know, empathy because, and, and we do here, we, we really just wanted to provide these as tools. We don't have a specific uh, demand management target here. We have those larger targets, um, but we're trying to say, hey, you know, this is available for you. Um, make use of it as you see. Maybe, maybe in a couple of years, this is what you would need and you're ready for. Um, but we just, we told council as part of our climate emergency action plan, we, we needed to be more intentional and at least, you know, providing that more direct outreach. Um, and yes, getting some positive uh, feedback. And again, you know, some businesses saying, you know, I'm, I'm concerned about other things right now. I'm concerned about my recovery or concerned about the, you know, the, the opportunities uh, for, for, for restaurants and, and some of that public life. And, and that totally makes sense. And, and we, uh, we want to be listening to when we hear that feedback. Yeah. What I, what I also like about this document is, and, and my, my background is really in health promotion and disease prevention. And I spent the good 15 years of my career on the front side helping Fortune 500 companies, you know, decrease their, their overhead and their, the bottom line cost, you know, through health and, and, and doing what we could to, you know, prevent the preventable. And, uh, and I love the fact that, you know, as part of this document right up front here is, you know, that target of trying to encourage people or remind people that, Hey, uh, you know, 150 minutes of moderate physical activity per week is, is essential. And one of the things that really 2020 drove home for us is just how incredibly important our health and well-being really is and our health status and our relative risk to um, success, susceptibility, <laughs> not easy for me to say, <laughs> to, uh, you know, to a raging pandemic. And so, uh, again, it was like we, we didn't know what was going to really sort of play out. Um, with this pandemic. And then it was just like, yes, you know, physical activity and well-being and life balance and all of that. So as a toolkit, I love this, you know, from a behavior change perspective, because it, even if that commute trip isn't the same, there's other trips. And that's one of the things I love about the way your city is tracking trips is you're not just tracking commuter trips. You're, you're looking at all daily trips. And so encouraging people to, you know, hey, you, you may be just working from home, you know, three or four days of the week, but what are those other short trips? And going back to what you had said about land use in the 15 minute mm -hmm. city, are you able to get some of those meaningful trips and, and, and get to those meaningful destinations, you know, by walking, biking and using transit? So I love the fact that that's, you know, in, in this document right up front, in addition to climate change, the other, you know, emergency that we have is our obesity epic, epidemic and our health and well-being. So as a health promotion professional, I appreciate that that's also in there. It's good stuff. Yeah. Anything else that we should talk about um, in this particular document? Uh, I don't think so. I think, okay. you know, a lot of it for your audience would be, you know, the some of the basics. But again, for a lot of businesses, um, this is sort of that kind of intro, that 101 that really, again, helps support them and or provides the, the, the sustainable transportation champion within to kind of be really a resource and support. So maybe just like... What's been exciting, John, is, you know, I was working in transportation planning and again, at the city level, it wasn't just a priority. And we, again, we had to look at all the possible ways in a decade, what can we do? And so demand management suddenly became more important to us. And so um, maybe I'll, I'll kind of transition to, you know, another part of that is, you know, we already had a school active uh, travel program very successful, very popular, uh, working, you know, school by school, uh, in a relationship that, you know, asked them what the needs were, safety, obviously, really key. Um, ultimately, you know, <clears throat> looking towards implementing infrastructure improvements. Uh, but through the Climate Emergency Action Plan, you know, looking at other cities and kind of how are they moving faster, we learned about school streets. And so through that, we um, began a pilot of three schools. Uh, last year, and we only did it for four weeks, and and you would think for for some of the parents that still needed to drive, which we totally understand, uh, but there were three three roads around the school that still provided opportunity to drive, and and one we closed 
um, in the in the pilot for the opportunity for the families, the kids, uh, the parents um, to have an open street to be able to you know open for walking, open for cycling, open to just chalk on the streets as kids, which is exactly what happened. Uh, play on the streets, you know, for that, you know, busy, you know, rush in the morning and the evening, you know, hugely successful. I think if my numbers are right, it's um, 32% of the family's kids, you know, said they walked more. I think 29% said they biked more and we measured, you know, people driving as well. And there was a 29% decrease in the driving around the school. Um, so hugely successful, and so we're we're now trying kind of a longer uh, ten month um, opportunity through school streets, and hoping to you know launch another seven uh, next spring. Still a pandemic though, so we're struggling a bit with the volunteer recruitment. It was a little easier for parents. We need some help supporting the uh, the, the street. Um, and again, open to to walking and biking, close to cars, but to put the barriers up. Uh, and so how's that a partnership with the school and the community? We're still, we're still working on that. We run into some challenges, but hugely successful as a pilot. And again, something we would have otherwise without the climate emergency continued doing school after travel. Um, we just um, have added new things. So again, we were adding um, walk and bike and roll mini grants, $500 over 20 schools this year. You choose how you want to promote walk, bike, roll to your school. You're you're kind of the experts in your own community. And then the one we're just about to launch is a walking school bus. Again, not new. And yet, again, when, when you're trying to move that reduction of greenhouse gases for vehicles at 40% and not everybody's turning over their car and not everybody's changing their land use uh, in, in a decade and where they live and they love their communities, um, so really trying to look at all those um, opportunities uh, for people to make the choices that are easier for them towards uh, sustainable mobility. Yeah. I was a little slow on getting your statistics up here for the pilot, but I'm burying the lead a little bit because, you know, obviously you, you see that 32 percent, you know, of the families did walk more. But the number that I'm hiding is, of course, that 70 for 76 percent mm -hmm. of the parents said that they would like to see the school you know, streets continue. So I think that's. Uh, a, a very, very encouraging thing when you see, you know, that three quarters of, you know, those parents are like, yes, we, we do. You know, even if we didn't necessarily have an active opportunity to participate, we still want to see this continue because there's a, a bright future for that. Now, we have a video for this. Should we play that? Yeah, please go yeah. ahead. A school street is a car-free block open to walking, cycling, and rolling beside a school during pickup and drop-off times. Um, in Vancouver, this was for a period of 30 to 45 minutes in the morning or afternoon. Uh, we were really excited to partner with three local elementary schools in order to pilot school streets um, and see if they could help to improve safety, reduce carbon pollution, and encourage healthier and active transportation. What this street looked like was just a parade of cars and parents dropping off and it did create a lot of anxiety amongst parents, safety concerns and kids walking through cars that were stopped. Um, and of course kids are small so they really have a low profile. Uh, a lot of parents were concerned. About. Um, every day around 840 they close the street so kids can walk uh, past the street or bike to go to school. Well, in the morning, you usually have kids around here. They are drawing, they are playing. This morning, we had bike day. Uh, and afternoon, usually, you can see parents that are standing all around the street because now they have space. Yeah, like, it's been amazing since you can do anything on the street. Yeah. And I think more people have biked because we're allowed to, like, bike around on the street. You can bike on the road and you don't even have to be careful with the cars that you <laughs> Well, the main reason would be safety for the children and the parents are commuting to and from school. But an alternative reason that's good for the environment when we reduce traffic around the school. And uh, I think an added benefit that some people don't know about is that I've been getting reports that children are actually waking up earlier and leaving their house earlier just so they can get to school and experience the street, which makes them, of course, be at school on time. We have noticed it. it certainly we've noticed there's, there have been fewer cars, you know, compared with the number we had normally on Comox. We know the weather is good, but, but definitely we've seen fewer cars. I think the project has been very successful and very positive. And if we had a choice, I would like to see it continue at our school and other schools. 
yeah, we are hoping you will come back <laughs> next year. Yes, I would like to see more of this more often and faster. <laughs> We would love School Streets to continue. It's changed how it feels to pick up and drop off kids. It feels smoother, safer, less frustrating. We love it. I want it to continue because I don't have to worry about the cars and I get to like draw chalk on this road. Yeah, I think um, just what I was really excited about, John, was um, those were like the parents, the principals, uh, kids in the community, right? We we didn't do any like recruiting. These were just actual testimonials. Um, Laura on my team, she's amazing. Um, I was just so impressed. Uh, obviously, you know, really genuine. And then maybe one thing that because we never really liked that road close sign, so we have a better signage uh, now, which is great. Streets open for walk bike roll, and so that's kind of been an exciting um, advancement. And you know, again, but it has its challenges. Um, but I, but I think again, just being empowered to enable and work at that community level um, to have you know outcomes neighborhood by neighborhood is is really ultimately what um, the climate emergency action plan kind of points to. It doesn't you know we have to have some of the the bigger topic conversations like you know pricing, but you know we need to be working at all levels and working at that school neighborhood level is is kind of one of the more rewarding ones. That particular street, that that name was familiar. Is that one of the streets that is, you know, one of the, like the bikeways and is typically one of the slower streets? Yeah, I think one of the one that was profiled was actually our Comox Greenway, something that we had improved um, about five years earlier. And so we actually chose the school street pilot um, where they each had uh, a bike route nearby simply okay. because we thought people you know cycling to the school was going to be important and that's uh, also turned into an exciting conversation because we were really clear this is a pilot and and yet uh, certainly for uh, the lord roberts school with comox greenway people were wondering you know and asked us you know maybe don't come back with a, a longer version of this can you just start talking about permanent infrastructure and we're like we're open to that uh, but that that's not the pilot conversation. Pilot, I think, has shown that it's at least in that realm of possibilities. Uh, but certainly that is ultimately what we would hope is these pilots don't just find a way to sustain themselves. But ultimately, in some cases, maybe this one, um, it's going to show that maybe a, a more, like you said, that incremental, right? That That's a part of our journey and our story is um, I fully believe in some of these school street pilots, they will transition into a larger public engagement. Uh, for a permanent street design as and when that makes most sense. And the pilot has helped prove that that's possible at that network and community level. Yeah. And it's it's kind of the this process of reimagining what our streets are for. And uh, so talk a little bit about this uh, this particular uh, project that's also happening. And I'm, I'm assuming, I, this could be a, a, a false assumption, but I'm assuming based on the sign that's behind uh, this, this gal, that uh, this might have been a, a response that you know, came about during the pandemic. Is that correct? Yeah, Slow Streets, uh, again, we were following other uh, leads like you know, Oakland and other you know, US cities or, or European cities that were you know, really taking that opportunity of the pandemic and, and reduce travel completely, including cars to repurpose uh, road space. Uh, and so we have learned a lot about mobility and public life. And so our slow streets was really that accelerating that road space reallocation on streets that, you know, in my team's long range planning, we're already looking like ones uh, that might be good for consideration as, you know, future bikeways or greenways or existing ones that we really felt were appropriate uh, to, to have either car light or car free. And so most of these are car light because they're not really preventing cars from uh, using the street, but trying to encourage even in the neighborhood in a grid network, there are maybe adjacent north, south or east, west streets, just trying to encourage the community to more often use those, make these slow streets uh, more for people walking and cycling. So uh, again, great, great credit to our design team. They did about 40, I think over 40 kilometers of slow streets. Um, over uh, the greater part of a year and a half. And so, again, uh, success, yes. Uh, we've had great feedback uh, from those who have already been enjoying and, and appreciated that road space reallocation for public life, for walking and biking. Uh, 
Um, and same time, they're, they're barriers and they are movable. <laughs> and so some people, uh, you know, complaining that, you know, they get moved and, and what are you doing? So uh, the team is, is genuinely rolling up their sleeves. And in some cases, um, you know what, we're going to have to retreat. We're just not at the right time, don't have the opportunity to take 40 kilometers of slow streets and make them all into better bike lanes and greenways. Um, and yet there's been lots of good lessons learned for the, so my team's, for example, involved in the learnings and trying to create now through our climate emergency action plan, what's a five-year walking plan? What's a five-year cycling plan? So these slow streets absolutely have been then successful uh, citywide to to help inform where that tangible capital infrastructure should go as a priority to sustain you know that progress for walking and biking. And then the other part about the the slow streets that I think was was really helpful was. We were all learning in the pandemic, you know, more how to deliver equitable mobility as we just learn more about our disproportionately impact communities. So um, as compared to our previous five year bike network, which was, you know, much more driven by where are we going to move the dial the most in terms of people cycling? The slow streets really started to uh, bring in that disproportionately impacted and uh, communities and provide more of these slow streets in those neighborhoods. And we got a lot more to learn. Uh, but in, in a kind of roll up the sleeves team effort, um, my team on the planning side was able to work with our design team to kind of suggest where these slow streets. And we're really excited that that's, that's something that we lean into and we have more to as we go forward and, and better understand our communities and where we can actually, um, when all things being equal, we can make, you know, investments in sustainable mobility where, where people haven't had as much opportunity, let's say, over the last decade. Yeah, yeah. And I paused on this uh, particular photo because it, it, it also sort of illustrates the other thing that we saw, you know, kind of emerge during the pandemic was reimagining our street space for, for other purposes. And so it looks like we've got some uh, picnic tables that are out there, maybe expanding the, the, the dining experience, um, which uh, is that sort of what was happening with this one, too, or these uh, the, the this uh, extended dining experience over here on the street is this something that 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 popped up in 2020 or was this something that existed prior to the pandemic uh well very little prior to the pandemic okay. and yeah this was um, very much like other cities but a, a, a massive response and huge credit to we have a whole public space division now who gives leadership to this but yeah being able to respond to uh, businesses and patios and yeah we had a whole you know um, making streets for people and I know early on in the pandemic, that was also like, yeah, room to queue. I thought that one just showed in terms of where that, you know, space, you know, yeah. needed to be in terms of like physical distancing. But as the pandemic went on and of course we found, found ways with masks and other things to, to, to manage our lives and, and kind of bring back some of the, the business and, and the public life, um, turn more into plazas and, and just, you know, ongoing programs, bringing that to council, you know, what can stay in the winter, what should, you know, be only for kind of summertime use. Um, and then I guess specific to mobility, this is uh, Beach Avenue. And this is an exciting, this is actually a phase two of Beach Avenue. So Beach Avenue is, uh, is a major arterial street uh, downtown, but right next to, as you can see, some of our, our beautiful waterfront and seawall. And so what we did, again, to, to begin to actually support more, like you said, that health of walking outside, uh, we wanted and we gave over the, the biking portion of our seawall here in this part of Vancouver and asked that people cycling, um, and we gave up space on Beach Avenue to Arterial. So phase one though, we, we actually could only have that Arterial traffic go in one direction, including transit, uh, to be able to do that. This is actually phase two. Um, so as you can see here, we have now much more of a concrete protected, and we've brought back, you can't really see it, but there are now two lanes, again, of vehicle travel, which includes transit. So that's really important for serving, you know, this part of our downtown, there's um, local transit, and that's back. And now this provides that width, again, back to cycle logistics. Uh, but for the time being, it's also, you know, maintaining the, the larger part of the, the waterfront seawall for more walking um, while providing ample space uh, for people cycling. And the other thing that we did here in the permanent, I um, can't remember if there's another photo that shows you the pedestrian crossings. Um, so again, you know, people cycling, uh, whether it's for recreation or community. Yeah, thank you. That one there, just go back. Oh, that's another version. But if you can go back to the... Um, the one, yeah, this is, you know, showing that, you know, we, we you know, pedestrians are still number one um, and making sure that even as people, we had over, 
you know, an average of 10,000 people cycling a day on this beach, beach uh, avenue, um, you know, uh, cycling infrastructure. But at the same time, we wanted to ensure, um, as we did, and we brought back uh, transit. And so we have some little bus boarding islands uh, that are also part of this um, more tangible protected infrastructure here on beach. So yeah, quite a success. And then working, uh, connecting to this was uh, our park board making a nice uh, uh, road space reallocation for people cycling. So people had the opportunity to bike if they wanted up to 10 kilometers around Stanley Park in a temporary uh, protected bike lane, only then to be able to come either to or from this Beach Avenue uh, road space uh, opportunity. And again, really starting with walking in public life in the actual park and then repurposing road space uh, away from vehicles to provide that opportunity for and more elbow room uh, for people of all ages to to cycle. Yeah, yeah. And I'll go back to this shot because I love this shot because it really emphasizes just, you know, how much stuff is going on in this particular environment. I mean, you you, you see the bus uh, up there and you, you see uh, motor vehicles going in both directions. Um, yeah, so... There's there, there we could have an entire discussion just on on what we see in this photo, but we can't do that. <laughs> I do want to talk about one of uh, we, we've got some drawings here, some renderings of one of your biggest challenges. And, and bridges typically are huge challenges for cities um, around the globe when it comes to mobility. Talk a little bit about this, uh, this bridge and, 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 and give a little background and I'll try to find that photo. Sure. Yeah. Well, remember how when I started, I said my first project was this false creek pedestrian and bike uh, strategy. And so we have three bridges connecting um, our downtown to what we have as our central Broadway area across what's called False Creek. And since I started at the city, uh, we have made huge improvements for people walking and cycling on our broad bridge. Uh, that was first uh, and highest importance. And then more recently, uh, and that's the west of this, what you're going to look here and I'll explain in a moment, is Gramble Bridge. Uh, and then to the east of that in Vancouver is Canby Bridge. It was a newer bridge, uh, but only had one side of the uh, bridge really protected for, for active modes. And we've reallocated uh, a lane on that bridge to improve uh, both walking and cycling. So here we are now with Gramble Bridge, the one in the middle, which was least uh, in priority in, in the strategy, but over a 20-year strategy. Now the time has come. This is a 1950s a bridge. Uh, so my team would say it's poetic that now we are um, reallocating what was never actually, John, though, able to be used. That's the irony. This is a 1950s bridge, uh, eight travel lanes with signals on both ends. You can't actually move enough cars that you'd ever actually make good use of those eight lanes. Right. Uh, so a really good big credit to our, our design team who went out with multiple phases of engagement to land what's now called the, the Granville Bridge uh, Connector, which of course is about connecting people, like you can see there in the image, uh, the downtown, and in the far, you can see the North Shore Mountains um, of the region, uh, to what actually on the other side is where we're delivering now another part of the regional rapid transit, our Broadway subway. It's already the second largest economic center in the province of British Columbia. And meanwhile, we're doing a large area community plan, intensifying the jobs and the housing, and again, back to that 15-minute city. So this will be actually the Granville Bridge connector looking you know, west towards the sunset, and that's the beautiful Broad Bridge, Heritage Bridge there, 1930s bridge that you'd be able to look on. And so through many configurations and concepts uh, and public process, this version of the Granville Bridge connector having uh, a wider sidewalk for, again, carrying both people walking first, uh, and then a two-way protected bike lane to, again, that nice social a uh, cycling kind of opportunity um, across this otherwise 1950s highway-oriented bridge, connecting people, connecting places on on both sides uh, in a way that can still support the goods movement, uh, the cars, uh, and the, the tons of public transit buses on the Granville Bridge. And so we didn't want to compromise that um, in, in in delivering what will now be a fantastic uh, walking and cycling opportunity. And then when this is complete, we will have uh, had better walking and cycling, at least from the start of my career, on all three False Creek bridges uh, connecting downtown and, and the Broadway area. Fantastic. That's so great. All right. Where are we going now, Dale? Well, I, can I talk about pricing? I mean, it's Let's not... Let's do it. It's Let's do it. As much, but I, think, I think it's really important, because again, as I explained, it's 
it's a it's a it's a game changing opportunity. Um, so we benchmarked and looked at, of course, the Stockholms and the Londons mm-hmm. and the Gothenburgs and the Singapores, and it turns out all those cities um, and those have been mostly done for for either congestion reasons or revenue generation, and that's not why we feel that we need to have a conversation on transport pricing in the city center. It was from a climate emergency perspective, um, it's the one tool that's proven to be effective that helps people think about that trip before they make it if they're having a journey into the city center. It's the place in the region and the city that has the best transit today and it can improve for tomorrow. And so whether or not in the end through this journey, Ultimately, there's a decision on it. It's just an important conversation that we need to have, helping people understand the pace of road space reallocation that we have to do, the the building up the public realm and the vibrancy of our city center and bringing back that business recovery and public life and understanding that we only have a certain amount of choices that we can make with our roads in that public space. And pricing has proven out over time to, to help shape that and where we could ultimately have, um, in the end, we think less vehicles, but delivering more people. That's what it's got to be about. So it's it's many uh, would shy away from this conversation. I think it's good that many other U.S. cities are also adventuring this, but I would highlight we're approaching it from a climate emergency perspective, and that's going to be an important part of our upcoming work. We're in an exploratory phase, feasibility study, uh, approaching this where we're going to take years of engagement um, and then ultimately, if council makes a decision, it would only be implemented in 2026. So that's just want to give you like give you the idea that this is not an easy conversation, but it's but it's essential in terms of if we're serious about that 40 percent, if we're serious about truly uh, making that target by 2030, um, where we'd have two thirds of daily trips in the area where the largest number of our trip making and uh, shared road space is. Um, it's just kind of put us in that. So it's, it, it takes courage. Uh, and at the same time, it's, um, it's, it's an important one for us to have and, and to do that in the context of the region. Because, of course, we care a lot about those because a lot of the people that might otherwise make a, chip, a shift change um, from, let's say, driving into transit into our city center are going to come from outside Vancouver. So we need to do this um, in, in partnership with, our, our, with TransLink who manages uh, not only the regional transit, but those regional relationships. And so, so I, I just, I just wanted to mention that I know this is active mobility, uh, but ultimately what it does is it unlocks, it unlocks so much of the opportunities to have wider sidewalks, unlocks opportunities to have um, more public space, more of those plazas, more of those parklets and unlocks the opportunity to have um, a, a greater amount of opportunities for that protected AAA cycle network. Um, in and around the downtown area where we'd be considering, the, you know, the, the, the city center pricing. So uh, lots more to talk about, probably do a podcast in another three years. Um, but, uh, you know, it was important for us to communicate to council that ultimately it does take uh, this game changing tool to be a part of and complement. And that was the other thing that we mentioned is um, they all complement each other. Demand management complements the infrastructure. The infrastructure complements the road space reallocation. And the road space reallocation, um, you know, talks about the pricing part, again, where it's needed in our city center. Not everywhere in the city is that necessary between now and 2030, just in kind of the, the, the largest concentration of jobs, uh, people, tourism and public space. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to bring up uh, this image once again, because uh, as you were talking about, uh, you know, the pricing and the structure, it really brought back a lot of the, um, the, the, the behaviorist in me and a lot of the incentives that we have when we look at, at changing um, health behavior and behavior modification um, you know, initiatives. We look at, you know, all the different things uh, that we're trying to do to, to really uh, take away the friction from the behavior that you'd like to see. And so we have a, a, an image like this where we, you know, have created a truly safe and inviting environment, one that also is, you know, helping out from, from that climate emergency standpoint and, and helping on, on so many different levels. Uh, and so this is partly that safe and inviting 
uh, incentive that is there, uh, an environment that embraces that behavior change. And then the pricing structure goes hand in hand with this because then you're, you're saying, okay, well, now that we've you know taken away some of the friction for the behavior we want to see, how do we add a little bit of friction to you know what we'd like to see less of? And also, to your point, it's one of the only truly proven strategies, um, you know that that really helps and and shifts yeah. you know people over towards active mobility, over towards transit, is. You know, that that, you know, friction that is in place, you know, for just simply jumping in your car and driving to the downtown area. And so having that sort of pricing structure uh, is, I think, just absolutely brilliant from a behavior change perspective. Um, I think that, you know, we've seen in in communities and cities globally that when you have built out a, a network, a truly, uh, you know, safe and inviting all ages and abilities network, and it starts becoming the the practical and pragmatic choice. Humans are humans everywhere. It doesn't matter if you're in the Netherlands or in in the, in Copenhagen or in Vancouver or even in Los Angeles. You're going to make that that choice based on you know those incentives. And if we've you know created a system and an entire network where you're able to, to you know, facilitate that shift, uh, I think it's brilliant. So more power to you. I have hopes that New York City will also, uh, you know, once again, be able to, to bring that back forward. And so keeping my fingers crossed that we'll also see that happen in that context, in that environment. And then I'm cheering on, uh, you know, more cities that are, you know, really, you know, have been addicted over the past, you know, 50, 60, 70 years of that, you know, frictionless environment of, of driving to their city core centers and, and, and core. So I appreciate that you had that difficult discussion because I think it's beautiful. I think it fits right in with uh, what Active Towns is all about and what we're trying to do to support uh, healthy, active, uh, you know, lifestyles and behavior. So. And maybe just one more, because you, you brought sure. up um, you know, again here with, with the urban freight and, and goods movement is, yeah. and, and if you have any advice for us, let us know, John, like reliability, um, because the pricing absolutely uh, obviously relates to shifting. It's, it's not just shifting modes, though. It's time of day. We want to be really yes. welcoming um, for especially goods movement. But even when people, there's, there are many people that need to make driving trips and and so the conversation isn't all about shifting, but it's about, well, could that happen at a different time of day? But what we, what we all at least might gain is reliability. Um, and so where we have that road space. So, yeah, that's kind of one that's hard for people in, in the kind of engagement, you know, understand. And we're going to try and work on it from an access and a metric perspective. But um, I just thought I'd mention that because certainly in the conversations, you know, we've had and we will continue to have on the goods movement and urban freight. Um, they, they have all especially understand, you know, the, again, we're not doing this for congestion, but, but where we all share the road space uh, more and throughout the hours of the day, it really does increase whether you're on the bus, you're actually making your own driving trip for when you need to, or your, your goods are moving around. Um, it just brings more reliability, which is, which is good for the economy and, 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 and also good for, for everybody's mobility. Yeah. And I think reliability fits right into that concept of uh, humans making pragmatic choices. You know, if you if you know that, you know, making that trip, you know, via transit or, you know, a, a active mobility mode is going to be the most reliable of your choices, you're going to do that. You're going to make that pragmatic choice. And so I know that's that's how I am when, you know, I get around yeah. my city here in Austin. I know that it's way easier. It's way more reliable for me to jump on my bike and, and ride to the grocery store and back versus, you know, even thinking about getting into a motor vehicle, which fortunately I don't have to do very often. So <laughs> I'm very excited about that. Well, fantastic. Yeah. Dale, is there anything that we haven't talked about that you want to make sure you live or leave our audience with here? You know, I, I guess I briefly touched on, um, you know, that we have the province in partnership, you know, through their Clean BC on that urban cycle logistics. I briefly mentioned 
when it comes to the pricing conversation. Um, you know, TransLink, we need to partner with, and we're excited about that. And of course, TransLink's doing great things at the regional level. Um, and so I just want to, you know, as, as a city government, I, I really want to emphasize for your audience that, you know, this is, this is the type of things we need to work with, in our case, the senior level of the government. And I guess I'm excited to share it. I'm not quite sure caught up on your, your U.S. and your latest infrastructure bill that your President Biden approved. I think it's, I'm hearing good things. Uh, but we have a federal active transportation strategy, and they've just announced the opportunity in particular to partner um, with our national government, both in, in my realm on planning studies. So it might be more of these cycle logistics, might be more of these five-year walk and cycle plans, but also um, hopefully to accelerate a lot of the design and infrastructure projects as well. And so I do mention that because if if we're going to, you know, in Glasgow just happen, you know, if we're going to be serious about it, it's not a city level conversation, it's not a regional, it's, it's a world conversation. And so I'm excited to share that uh, for us at the city, we've got healthy regional partnerships, provincial and and now going forward, especially especially now in active transportation with our, our national government. And so I just want to maybe finish there. Because I think that's that's really what it's going to take is um, you can maybe point to certain cities doing certain good things, uh, but at the scale that we need to see in the next decade across Canada, across the U.S. and across the world, um, we need to see that cross-governmental, different levels at different scales, all working together. Um, and I hope I hope that's the case in in your nation, and I hope it's in mine. But I'll end there because I think that's in another part of our hopefully our journey ahead. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. And and, uh, and Active Towns as an organization did sign on to the open letter that was delivered um, at uh, uh, COP26 um, talking about just that, that, that we really need to have uh, active transportation be a part of that conversation that's happening, you know, globally, nationally, at the provincial level, the state level here in the States and, and also in, in the city. Dale, thank you so very much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. Thank you for the invitation, John. It's been great. Thanks for the time. Thank you all so much for tuning in to episode number 103 on the Active Towns podcast. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Dale about the amazing work being done up in Vancouver, BC. Yes, they have a long, long way to go yet especially in their neighborhoods farther out from the downtown. But along with Montreal on the East Coast, it is a fantastic North American example of what can be achieved when a city makes an authentic effort to build out their cycle network. To learn more, be sure to check out the links in the show notes and more importantly on the landing page for this episode at activetowns.org. Well, that's all for this week's episode. But before I let you go, just a few quick reminders. The regular podcast is taking a break for the holidays, and we'll be back on January 7th with a conversation featuring Leonard Nout from MobiCon in the Netherlands. And please tune in for my holiday live streaming get-together this coming Monday, December 20th at 6 p.m. Eastern. Details in the show notes and on the Active Towns YouTube channel. And finally, please help me to grow the Active Towns culture of activity movement by making a donation to Active Towns, spreading the word and subscribing. Thank you also very much for your support and for tuning in. Until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health and happiness. Cheers and happy holidays. Happy holidays.